Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tzvi Gilboa, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Michael Everson, who is our next speaker. Tangut is an ancient northwestern Tibeto-Burman language, once spoken in the Western Sha, also known as the Tangut Empire. It has been dead for thousands of years, and the speakers of the language also have been dead for several thousand years. But a few days ago, a couple of them came back to life. And when that happened, they wanted to share the miracle with the world by posting a status on Facebook. Now, you must be asking yourselves, how do you do that with a language that predates Facebook or the internet? And the answer is because our guest today, Michael Everson, has already taken care of all of that. Michael Everson is an expert in the writing systems of the world. He is active in supporting minority language communities, especially in the fields of character standardization and internationalization. He is one of the co-authors of the Unicode standard and as, is a contributing editor and Irish national representative to the committee responsible for the development and maintenance of the universal character set. He is a linguist, typesetter, and font designer who has contributed to the encoding in of many scripts and characters. In 2005 and 2006, his work to encode the Balinese and ENCO script was supported by the UNESCO's initiative Babel program. Michael received the Unicode Bulldog Award in 2000 for his technical contributions to the development and promotion of the Unicode standard. Active in the area of practical implementations, Michael has created local and language information for many languages, from support for Irish and the other Celtic languages to the minority languages of Finland. In 2003, he was commissioned by the United Nations Development Program to prepare a report on the computer local requirements for Afghanistan, which was endorsed by the Ministry of Communications of the Afghan Transitional Islamic Administration. He prepared a number of fonts and keyboard layouts for the operating of, uh, system of a computer that uses a fruit as its logo. Michael was born in Norristown, Pennsylvania in 1963 and moved to Tucson, Arizona at the age of 12. He studied German, Spanish, and French for his BA at the University of Arizona and the history of religions and Indo-European linguistics for his MA at the University of California, Los Angeles. He moved to Ireland in 1989 and was a Fulbright Scholar in the Faculty of Celtic Studies, University College, Dublin. He then founded Evertype, because all he does is ever is type, and <laughs> uh, has been active in uh, numerous fields about which he is just about to tell you in his talk entitled down to the letter, why typography and language diversity matter. Welcome. Apparently I did all those things. Ta, oops. Anna, a hosor and vehenshaw could love it live if we over cloak of and you. I am delighted to be here today to talk to you about typographic matters and hopefully to be some light entertainment. I really don't know about the why there. You're going to have to figure out the why for yourself. I've uh, sort of made a name for myself for having added many scripts and characters to the universal character set. 
in addition to publishing a wide variety of material in minority languages, and I've been asked today to talk to you about some unusual things, uh, including writing, the underlying encoding in your computer, the relationship between encoding and fonts, and some of my publishing activities, which are relevant to the question of multilingualism. So let's talk about writing. The invention of writing thousands of years ago enabled the transmission of cultural data of all kinds. This clay tablet, written in cuneiform, gives an account of barley rations issued monthly to adults and children written in the year four of King Urukagina, about 2350 BCE. In China, early writing was preserved on bones and shells used for divination. Uh, hieroglyphic resemblances between Chinese characters and their pictorial forerunners can be seen in some of the glyph shapes on this simulacrum of a turtle plastron. Plastron is apparently the technical term for the ventral part of a turtle shell. Uh, this is an inscription in the oracle bone script. Writing has also been uh, invented or reinvented much more recently. Uh, this is an early 19th century sample of handwritten Cherokee numbers and handwritten typographic letter forms. Ingenious methods of writing language quickly were developed in many countries before recording technology was invented. This text here says, with the words drink me beautifully printed on it in large letters, it was all very well to say, drink me, but the wise little Alice was not going to do that in a hurry. No, I'll look first, she said, and see whether it's marked poison or not. And you can see here I've just made the word drink me, which appears twice blue, and uh, the word poison is there red, and there's a little squiggly line under that, which is going to tell the person reconstructing this that it's to be in italics. And we've pretty much forgotten this technology now, but libraries are full of it. Getting away from handwriting, though, stamps for impressing into clay were an early means for producing multiple copies of text and images. Punches to impress images onto coins were also forerunners of this technology. And wood blocks were inked to produce poster-like reproductions. All of these things were necessary precursors to the invention of movable type. Now, the world's first known movable type system for printing was made of ceramic materials and created in China around 1040 CE by Bi Sheng uh, during the Northern Song Dynasty. The illustration here shows some Jin Dynasty paper money dated to 1215 or 1216, uh, which had bronze movable type used as a measure against counterfeiting. I guess this is similar to the way we have serial numbers on paper money now. Uh, in 1377, the first metallic types were invented in Goryeo Dynasty in Korea, which were used to print Jikji Shimcheo Jeo, the anthology of great Buddhist priest Zen teachings, uh, which is the oldest extant movable metal print book. Uh, this is a replica of one of the original typographic type forms for the Jikji. And here's a modern print taken from one of those replicas. Metal movable type was invented in Germany between 1440 and 1450 by Johannes Gutenberg of Mainz. Gutenberg was a goldsmith familiar with techniques of cutting punches for making coins from molds. And you can see here that the type cut for his Bible was reminiscent of black letter handwriting that you would find written um, in manuscripts uh, of, of the time and of centuries before that. More familiar to us, is the Roman type cut by Nicholas Jensen in Venice uh, about 1470. Now here you can still see manuscript forms. There's a, a, a little, a little three-like thing next to this Q, and that means que. Over there. Where is it? There it is. Uh, and that that oh, sorry that sort of thing was uh, was written in manuscripts by hand, and when they were setting these things in type, they were they were they were repeating some of that um, because it was the habit of of reading and writing. Um, uh, in any case, this is really a fully modern typeface, which was adopted as it's completely influenced all subsequent printing in the Latin script. 
Italic type was designed uh, by Ludovico Arrighi in uh, uh, 1527, uh, also on the basis of some manuscript hands, but it was only later that Italic typefaces were mixed in with Roman typefaces to give the kind of emphasis that we use today. A lot later, after a centuries of great flourishing of fine typography, typewriter technology sort of dumbed down the available character set due to the physical limitations of the device. In the 20th century, personal computing and the internet gave rise to profound transformation in communication. The first generally available personal computers had 8-bit code pages, enabling up to 256 different characters to be used and exchanged. But 256 characters are not enough. So the universal character set was devised, defining a code space with 1,114,112 characters, of which about 120,000 are, are, are available actually for, for use. Um, language diversity can be preserved and expanded with this kind of global communication, and the chief tool for this is the underlying encoding of text based upon the universal character set, which is better known as the Unicode standard. 8-bit character sets had extensions for languages uh, which used diacritical marks, but they still owed very much to the character set available on typewriters. And you see there, the, the, the blue is, the, is the, the shift on the typewriter, or uppercase, and the, the yellow is the lowercase. Uh, and there's accented vowels over there, but still half the thing is just typewriter stuff. The Unicode standard has as its Primary goal, the encoding of all the world's writing systems, and there are over 130 scripts already encoded. This is a lot. Um, but that's not all the scripts there are in the world. There are some 90 more that we know that are uh, at least possible candidates for encoding. And um, there will always be need for extensions to the currently encoded scripts um, still needing to be made. I thought I'd show a few of these um, code charts. Uh, the Cyrillic block includes letters for Russian and Bulgarian, but also for the Turkic and other minority languages of the Russian Federation and other countries. Hanze or kanji are encoded as CJK unified ideographs, which includes simplified Chinese, traditional Chinese, Japanese, Korean, um, and Vietnamese characters. Sometimes the differences between these things are very subtle, but are nationally significant. So um, it's important to, to know if you are writing uh, something, what language your CJK font favors. So you don't use a Chinese font for Japanese or a Korean one for Chinese, because the users can tell the difference and they don't like it. The characters used by the major and minor languages of Ethiopia and Eritrea have been encoded. The Tibetan encoding supports languages in addition to Tibetan like Dzongkha, uh, Sikkimese, Ladakhi, and Balti. It supports punctuation and lots of symbols used in several countries. The basic Gardner set of Middle Egyptian hieroglyphs has been encoded, although there are more uh, sets of, hi of hieroglyphs. This writing system lasted a long time. The Latin script is very diverse and has many letters and letter forms which have been encoded. Recently, a fairly large number of European manuscript abbreviations were encoded, which is a very practical matter, at least if you're me. Um, I'm preparing an edition of Passion of Arluth, The Passion of Our Lord. Uh, it's one of the, uh, the, the, the Cornish medieval plays, and uh, you can see here that uh, at the top left uh, we have the modern revived standard Cornish text with an English translation on the right, but down below we have the diplomatic text, which shows all of the manuscripts, abbreviations and suspensions and funny characters. Um, now, because those characters are actually encoded, this diplomatic text can be sorted and searched and interchanged. Um, uh, I chose this particular package, pa passage because um, in the play, in the medieval play, they actually describe dialect. We say, Dre the go sithiu previs the vos de na alile, by your speech is shown that you are a man from Galilee. Linguistic diversity, get it? a unified cuneiform character set is available for use by scholars. 
And it is with Unicode, the universal character set, that the recorded history of our entire species can be digitized. We've come a long way from pressing characters into a small piece of clay. Uh, we can now share information with anyone who's online. Our ability to digitize cultural artifacts uh, from two or 3,000 years ago is actually important. It allows scholars to communicate with one another, students of those cultures and scripts to be able to access their work and make this inva information available to the general public in a digital format. There really are a lot of scripts in Unicode. Um, I could have d done slide after slide of them. This is Osmania and Burmese and Khmer and Saurashtra and Balinese and Sinhala and Kannada. But I'm sure all of you are wondering, are we going to get Klingon into Unicode? Okay, so I did it. I proposed to encode Klingon in 1997. And in 2001, the Unicode Technical Committee rejected it as inappropriate for encoding because there was a lack of evidence of, it, of usage published in literature and a lack of organized community interest in its standardization and no resolution of potential trademark and copyright issues and the status, question of status as a cipher rather than a script. But since then, all these people have been working really hard, and I think Bing offers some sort of Klingon support, and maybe, maybe Facebook or Google does, I'm not sure. Um, uh, so this might get picked up again, you never know. Not sure about Tenguar and Kirth, which I also proposed in 1997. These are well understood, and fonts exist that are based on the private use area encodings in the unofficial conscript Unicode registry. Um, but the scripts are actually owned by the Tolkens, um, at least for purposes like this, we'd want their blessing. And right now, it's not certain that they support an official encoding. Um, we'll see what happens, I don't know. Let's talk about ENCO. ENCO is a writing system and a kind of a compromise dialect. Uh, it's an inter-dialectal orthography. Um, there's some 18 to 20 million speakers of it uh, in Côte d'Ivoire, the Gambia, Guinea, Liberia, Mali, Senegal, and Sierra Leone. Uh, the use of the script is gaining, in a num gaining ground in number despite uh, the, the Francophone governments, uh, which run the language of administration in those countries. Um, and co writes from, runs from right to left and has joining behavior like Arabic, although it's simpler. It was devised in the late 1940s by Solomon Akante of Guinea to be used for the Mandan languages of West Africa, and there is a vigorous and active user community. Um, the script was created in part because Arabic and Latin-based scripts were f perceived as to be foreign and not reflecting the native languages. Uh, after its creation, Solomon Akante set to translating and transcribing various Islamic religious texts into Inco, as well as works in history, science, linguistics, sociology, literature, and philosophy. He wrote Enco textbooks and a dictionary, and doing all this work by hand. And his books were then copied by hand by others. They had made forays by putting Enco glyphs on Arabic code positions, uh, and their original font was really not of the highest quality. Uh, it looks very much like it was devised by early auto tracing software. You can see that the ends of the verticals and the weight of the crossbars are not uniform at all. And UNESCO supported the encoding of ENCO and also the preparation of a rec rectified reference font. And you can see here how the lines are much smoother and the finials are uniform and it's easier to read, read and, 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 and better looking at larger sizes. We also prepared three uh, keyboard layout specifications for them. One was ergonomic and optimized for speed based on character frequency, but QWERTY and AZERTY were given as well for typists who may already have been familiar with English or French keyboarding and prefer to have ENCO SA on the S key and ENCO DA on the D key and so forth. The keyboard supported ENCO letters and characters used in bi-directional contexts, uh, the same sorts of characters one finds on Arabic and Hebrew and Persian keyboards, uh, as well as some generic symbols and ASCII punctuation. But now that it's been encoded, it's possible for there to be many ENCO fonts. I mean, here we have the original very rough font at the top, and then the rectified Conakry font, and uh, a, a, a new sans serif font, ENCO Noto Sans, which was released by Google. 
Now let's talk about Gaelic typefaces. The organizers wanted me to talk about fonts in some sense, but I wasn't really sure what to do about that because many of you, are, as far as I understand, are studying languages that are well served by many, 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 many fonts and Latin script fonts and that sort of thing. So there wasn't too much to say um, because those are ubiquitous and they must support the languages that you're using. But I know a little bit about the form of the Latin script, which was formerly used in Ireland. Um, and what makes Gaelic type Gaelic? The essential feature of it is that it makes use of insular letter forms. So these are letter forms that you're not familiar with because you haven't seen them probably. Um, uh, but the rounded D and the low F and the S-shaped G and the one-story T. Uh, older Gaelic typefaces usually have the insular R and the insular S, but later ones have the lowercase R and S based on the capital letter forms rather than on the insular ones. Of course, a Gaelic typeface which does not have support for accented Irish characters is pretty much useless. At a minimum, it has to have the five accented vowels, no dot on the lowercase i, and, and ten consonants with dots above, and this Tyronean et sign, which means and. Um, basically, the difference between most fonts, which are Carolingian and Gaelic fonts, which, uh, uh, which were insular, um, can be seen in this selection of Gs here. You have the serpentiform Gs there, and notice that the... Uh, the, the, the one fancy, fancy one, actually, this, this, this one, it owes, it's, it owes a lot to, to, to the, the insular tradition. Um, so you, maybe you'll never look at a letter G quite the same way again. I don't know. Maybe you will. Uh, there were early, I'm one of the people who ended up making some of the earlier digital uh, Gaelic fonts. Um, previously, amazingly, there were a uh, number of typewriter companies that made fonts, and this was used in Irish administration and things. The offices had to have two different typewriters, which is one reason they gave up the Gaelic fonts, because it was expensive. Um, I digitized three of these directly from, from you know, was put a piece of paper in and bash out the letters and then go scan that, and I rectified a couple of them. Um, one of my fonts was used by the National Museum of Ireland in a flyer they put out a few, few years ago in their temporary exhibition of neo-Celtic art, and that was a, kind of a surprise to see. Um, during the heyday of the usage of Irish typefaces, nearly all of them were really very Gaelic, uh, according to my classification. Um, and in the... Uh, some of the better Gaelic typefaces continue this good practice today, um, they're mostly used for display or shop signs and that sort of thing. Nobody prints books in them or anything. Uh, but book, book titles and chapter headings and things. A lot of fonts don't, however, and this is an important thing about authenticity. Um, you know, I said before, if, you're, if, you're, if you have a Chinese font and you use it for Japanese text, Japanese readers aren't going to like it. Um, and it's the same thing you know, in a tiny little country like Ireland where... Um, uh, it's best to, to do some research and make sure that if you're designing a font that you make it work properly. And there is no redeeming American Unseal. It is the comic sans of Gaelic type. I don't know why, but let's talk about the letter thorn. Every character has a story, and even a single letter may have attributes of interest. Uh, identification and misidentification of a character can be problematic. In case you don't know, the letter thorn derives from a runic letter, which was named thorn because it looks like a thorn. Um, and this was used in Old English and Norse. You have all seen it before, disguised as a letter Y. But ye olde yorn is actually not what that text should say. Um, <clears throat> it's always bothered me that this ye olde shoppy thing uh, is, is still prevalent, uh, because it was done historically, and we'll see in a minute that there's a reason for that, but it doesn't have much place now. Lewis Carroll in 1856 published a poem in sort of a fake Middle English called The Carpet Night, but it wasn't Ye Carpet Night. And I'll be preparing a new edition of this where I'm going to use thorns, um, because I just think it's the right thing to do. Um, I'll mention in my foreword that I've done this. And if some readers want to pretend that they're wise, they can do that, but they're not supposed to be wise. There was never a definite article, ye, in English, um, never. This is a 
interesting. A few years ago, I worked on a publication of the first Cornish Bible, translated by Nicholas Williams. I don't know how many people will ever read it, but they've been waiting for it for 400 years. Um, it was a lot of fun, and so I discovered that there was no Middle English Bible that was any, any, any available and any good, and since linguistically the Middle English texts are very interesting indeed, um, I decided that this was a gap that I should fill. So I went and I found some electronic text, um, uh, but it, uh, this is a text, text that I found, it was not hard to find on the internet, um, but whoever digitized it did a really bad job. Uh, because the 1850 edition edited by Josiah Forshall and Frederick Madden, published by Oxford University Press, you'll find, you'll see there that uh, here we have, in the, in the bottom line, the last line, and God said, Licht be mad, and Licht was mad. Well, you've got that yog there replaced by wise in the internet text, which means that the whole, the whole thing is, 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 is not properly encoded. And this is a very, very bad thing. Um, so uh, I found also, though, that I was quite shocked to find that in the 1850 edition itself, they had silently replaced all the thorns with TH. And I didn't really understand this, because in the actual text, there's plenty of thorns. I mean, you can see them right here. You can see how much the letter Y, which is circled in red, and the letter thorn have come to fall together and look very much alike, which is why they're putting a, a dot or a, or a line over the Y there to help distinguishing them. Um, so I got, this is the part where thorn saves trees. I, I got curious to know, so I took the whole text of the Bible and I stripped out every letter, B, C, D, all, everything except the TH digraph. And then I put them into a single file, and it was 104 pages long, 104 pages of TH separated by space. And then I turned those all into thorns, and it took up only 72 pages. So this means that a Middle English Bible using the correct and attested letter thorn is 32 pages shorter than one that which does not, uh, which means that thorn saves trees. So now I'm sure you really want to do this, so I suppose we're going to have to talk about emoji. <laughs> well, emoji became available, oh, what a hell it is. <laughs> emoji became available in 1999 on Japanese mobile telephones from three different companies, and they were very popular in Japan, and, but each mobile phone carrier developed differently and partially overlapping sets and the vendors each used their own text encoding extensions which were incompatible with one another and the vendors developed cross mapping tables which allowed in limited interchange uh, with phones from other vendors including email. And that's where it got the attention of Google. Because um, <clears throat> it started leaking out of the phones and, and, and into actual text. Uh, a wide variety of vendors supply emoji to users, and you can see here in the, in the column on the, uh, toward the right, it, it, it tells you what version of Unicode these things are in, and the, 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 the version six Unicode characters have all been uh, uh, supported by lots of vendors, but the version, version eight ones, which have just come out, have not been supported by most vendors at all. And so, I don't know. These have just been added, and uh, were these urgently needed? There's internet petitions. You know, the, 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 the American Sign Language community says, we need to have I, the I love you sign, and I say to them, it's like, what privilege is your sign language over the 200 others, you know? But they have an internet petition, and the Portuguese ones don't, I don't know. Anyway, I suppose the taco balances out the sushi. When emoji, you may remember this, I don't know, when emoji representing human beings appeared, there was in North America and nowhere else, uh, a lot of complaint about the evident skin tone of the emoji characters. This was Apple's fault, I think. If they had made them Simpsons or Smurfs, nobody would have noticed. Anyway, so they took this thing, the Fitzpatrick scale is a, helps to classify human skin with regard to its propensity to sunburn, not to its color. Uh, anyway, it lent its name to these, to these 
emoji modifiers, which can be used in ligation to change a Simpsons yellow generic face to one that looks like a variety of humans, which is fine. It makes people feel good about themselves. But the first thing that happened is some brewer comes to the consortium asking for Fitzpatrick modifiers to be applied so that light beer and dark beer can be... This is a slippery slope. Some of it really, to me, seems well and truly outside the uh, scope of, of, of character encoding. Anyway, how do emoji get encoded? Well, there's various ways. First, we had the Japanese tel telecom set, which was proposed by Google, and it had these characters here, which were named Bill with yen sign and Dollar Bill, and the character called Couple. And when this set went to international standards ballot, my comments through the Irish national body suggested that couple was not very inclusive and that more than dollars and yen were probably required. So banknote with yen sign and dollar sign were joined by banknote with euro sign and pound sign and couple was renamed man and woman holding hands and two men holding hands and two women holding hands were added. I have to say I'm rather proud of the hand holders. In the original proposal, there were many animals, and strangely, even though it came from Japan, only 72% of the animals of the Asian zodiac were, enco were, were encoded in the Japanese phone sets. So we thought, well, this is probably something we should you know, fill out, because the Western zodiac is encoded on some other page. Uh, so in comments, experts from Germany and Ireland added the rat, the bull, the ox, the crocodile, the goat, the sheep, and the rooster. The crocodile is used in Kazakhstan. Um, in East Asia, they use the dragon, which had already was in the Japanese telco sets. And sometimes you just get lucky when you're encoding uh, an, an emoji. I don't know. Uh, <coughs> there were lots of hand shapes in the emoji set, and we were adding a whole lot more in order to map webdings and wingdings to it. And in ballot comments <coughs> made through the Irish national body, I managed to get these encoded. You're welcome. <laughs> so let's talk about Wonderland. This is my favorite thing. Uh, I, am, I am the biggest Carolian publisher ever. I'm not in terms of absolute sales, but I've published Alice in more than 50 languages and Looking Glass in eight or nine, and soon to be one more. And, uh, a lots of sequels and parodies and all sorts of stuff, and it's a great thing. It's, 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 it's a lot of great thing. And I stumbled into this because Nicholas Williams, who translated the Bible into Cornish, had translated uh, uh, Alice in, in, into Irish. And, uh, well, in the spirit of linguistic diversity, and Bialach Shin Dort and Cut, I guess, a Egbogger to Lapadish. Taconi er hatter agus in belak shin agus e bagad lakin lapa elle taconi er hiri a marta. Tur court er kibe dinne aku is mean lat, ta shid as a maur vert. Ach nili megere dole mask din a ta as a waur a dort eilish. Nil lias got er shin a rua dort and cat. Tomage gulier as our maur and cha. Ta misha as maur, ta tussa as the waur, conus ta. Isagat go with Misha as Mawar, a dear Frigalis. How do you know that I'm crazy? She says. Kahatu, a ve as the wower, a dort and cut. No, ni, Chokwa and Shah, Sakedot. You have to be, otherwise you wouldn't have come here. There will be a little bit more of this later. That's how I got into this thing, with a minority language, in, which happens to be privileged by being the first official language of a country which mostly doesn't use it. Somebody has to, so I learned it. I don't know. Um, jumping back to fonts for a little bit, uh, one of the things that I, 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 I did recently was I, I published Alice in English in a dyslexic-friendly font. And what this is is basically a, a sans-serif font where they've made the bottom of it darker and fatter, and they've, they've angled some of the verticals slightly skewed. Uh, and apparently for some people, although research suggests that dyslexic-friendly fonts are not always effective for all dyslexic readers, it may, it, it has been found somewhat uh, useful to others. Um, and uh, so I just put that out. Uh, but at the same day that I put this out, I discovered that, uh, that a, a student at the London College of Communication in 2013, Daniel Britton, 
uh, who was dyslexic himself, I instituted a project which would uh, help to he designed a typeface that would be almost illegible to slow down the reading place of a non-dyslexic person so that they could feel the horror and humiliation and embarrassment of reading really, really slowly. And um, it is actually possible to read this, are you content now? So, well, I know the text said the caterpillar. Well, mm, sir, I should, I can't read that, anyway. Um, the, 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 way, the, the way he did it was he just took away 40% of the letters. And this is not what, I mean, this is not what dyslexics actually see. Um, this was just his mechanism of producing an effect uh, so that we would appreciate what it's like for them. Um, there are some other interesting alphabets. Uh, George Bernard Shaw hated English spelling and in his will he left some instructions and some money. Uh, for uh, uh, to have a contest to develop a new alphabet for the English language, and uh, this one was what was chosen. Um, it's featural. Uh, uh, you can look it up. Uh, the Shavian alphabet. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's probably a parallel universe with um, Zeppelins where this has been adopted, and we're all writing in the Shavian alphabet. Back in the 19th century, the Mormons invented an alphabet which was intended to help learning to write English easier. I published Alice in this. Again, it's a phonetic respelling, not just uh, new shapes for regular letters. Um, I think it's absolutely beautiful. I think it's just a very attractive, nice-looking, cool alphabet, and it's a pity that nobody really uses it for the world. Um, and all of you linguists will be very, very happy to go and buy a copy. I'm kidding, sort of. This is Alice in the IPA, um, and it is in received pronunciation. So it's, are you content now, said the caterpillar? Well, I should like to be a little larger, sir, if you wouldn't mind. I mean, it's all done. It's proper British pronunciation. It's really good. In fact, it has the linking R in some places and not in others and things, that sort of thing. Um, these are just some of the things that I've been doing because it's the 150th anniversary of Alice because this is an actually remarkable year and this book is something that the University of Virginia must buy and put in its library and you guys should actually look at this if you're interested in linguistic diversity. Um, this massive three volume study um, l l gives the bibliographical references to thousands of translations of Alice. Alice is one of the books that has been translated more than anything Pilgrim's Progress used to do that, but nobody reads that anymore. Um, and then there's a whole section of the Mad Tea Party where they back translate into, in, in, more or less literally into English so that you can get a flavor for what the Armenian translator did in order to approach this joke or that joke or that sort of thing. Um, Alice is a really remarkable book uh, for language learning, uh, partly because the wordplay invites all sorts of creativity on the part of the translators. Um, and, and partly because a lot of it is just relatively regular conversation um, and is, that's a good thing to learn to read if you're trying to get into a new language. So, I don't know. I have published a lot of these things. Um, I don't know if you want to hear me read any Icelandic, but uh, Thorar and Yeldjarn had, had published this and it had gone out of print and I got in touch with them and I said, hey, should we put this back? He said, sure, that'll be fun. And he says, Sorry, art, sag the cochter and a sweethy are the hagri lupuni, beer hatri, we sessary art, hailed han alfram a sweethful at the hini lupuni, beer mars heri. Father Samach won to him sucker, fair ir bowther bialaver. And by langer echi till a vera innan umbrella, the folk sag the Lisa. Oh, thou kemst no echi, thought he, sag the cochterin. Við erum öll brálúð hérna, ég er bláður, tú er brálúð, I can't pronounce that word well. Hvernig þykkast þú vita að ég sé brálúð, sagði Lísa. Þú hlutur að vera það, sagði kokturinn, annars hefur þú ekki komið hingað. I don't know. I have some more of these. I can do these if you want. They're kind of fun. They're not that long. Do you mind? Ab hoc latere felis pede dextro gesticula cadixic peta sorum venditor habitat ab altero latere pede sinistro gesticulata lepus martius habitat. Vise umtruvis uterque mente alienata est, at nolo cum hominibus insanis esse, 
but I don't want to go among mad people. Alicia inquit. Id debitari non potest felis inquit. Omnes hic insani somos ego insana som tu insana es. Cur existibus me insanam esse? Alicia rogavit necesse est. Sorry about the pronunciation. Necesse est inquit felis aliter huic non adus. I know there's traditions of pronouncing Latin and I got them all wrong there. Some of you are learning Spanish. How are many of you are learning Spanish? Hardly anyone? Gosh, well, I won't necessarily do this. This is Ladino. This is Judeo-Espanol. This is a dialect related to Spanish. It's pretty neat. It's pretty severely endangered. It's much more endangered than Yiddish, actually, um, as Jewish languages go. Uh, I've also then, we're getting toward a point, uh, been recently publishing in more endangered languages, uh, Polynesian languages. Maori isn't so bad off because it has a lot of government support. Um, and it's just come out and we're hoping there might be a hobbit in Maori. Because it's, New Zealand is Middle Earth and will make a fortune, right? I don't know. In the, guess, in the, in the gift shop on the way out. I don't know. Hawaiian is another Polynesian language which is very, very severely uh, endangered. Um, and in, Ho in Hawaiian, we actually have Alice and the Looking Glass and the Hobbit uh, because uh, the translator, Keao Nismith, is really, really excited about doing that sort of thing. Um, we have, I have published Alice in Belarusian, and this was, this was font relevant because I use a special set of fonts which give a look and feel to it, and there were no Cyrillic characters for it, so I had to devise them for it. Fortunately, I'm a font designer, and that's kind of kind of neat. Um, and I have, so I have, I have Alice in lots of dialects of German and dialects of French and various languages all throughout Europe and things. And then I've started branching out into much more difficult things. Uh, I have five Bantu languages now. Swahili is one of them. Shona and Shangani and, and uh, Zimbabwe and Ndebele are, are all there. Um, these are kind of hard to work with because I don't actually know these languages at all. But fortunately, you can hyphenate after any vowel. That's all you really need to, to do that, especially in something like Zulu where all the words are 17 letters long. Um, but these are actually um, being picked up and it looks like th they might do some local printing because it's cheaper than doing it outside of Africa and they might get into the schools and that would be a very, very good thing for linguistic diversity and for education in languages other than the European colonial languages, which is what they get most of the time. Uh, I mean, Zulu has millions of speakers, it's fine. How many of them are actually uh, literate? Well, that's a thing that needs to change. I read three or four days ago that Ghana has just uh, decided that they won't be educating in English any longer. They're gonna be using local languages. But there's like 80 languages in Ghana, so I don't know what they're gonna do. I published Alice in Middle English verse because in thought direction on the carta haber da shirwone than thought a march her runde waving his richt and than his lift pall after. Ye well mich this place you go visit another own for both ben mad. Ye neither lat ne so ni null to visit people that ben mad. No help for that, the cat replied, be glad, for we are all mad here, both e and thou. Who wish to e a mad, quod alles who, hit fall with, else thou no dost have come here. I won't read this next one, because this was translated by Peter Baker, who is sitting over here, and I won't embarrass myself by reading it in Old English, because he'll cringe, and I don't want to do that. Uh, but this was so much fun, and this sold really well, and you should all get a copy. That's what I think. We're, three more slides, okay. I've also published, this is locally relevant, I've published Alice in Appalachian English. Now you notice that, that, that for the regular translations, the color covers are red, but for the transportation into parallel universes, I mean, this is set in 1350, um, and this is set in Appalachia. So it's been changed, they don't play croquet, they play baseball. 
Uh, and this was translated by Byron Sewell and Victoria Sewell, and Byron also does the illustrations for these special editions. Up the creek, the bobcat says, waving well, hits right paw round, lives an old bar, what thinks he's chief cornstalk, and down the creek, waving t'other paw, lives a Civil War veteran who fit on both sides again himself. Visit whichever you like, they're both touched. But I don't want to go amongst touched folks, Alice remarks. You can't help that, says the bobcat. We're all touched here. I'm touched, you're touched. How you know I'm touched, says Alice. You must be, says the bobcat, or you wouldn't have come up here in these high hollers. There you go. Language diversity and how digital representation affects it is important. If your written language is not encoded, then you can't communicate effectively using computers or the internet or things. If it is encoded, but you, it is not Im implemented in fonts or keyboards because your population is too small or your population is really large but has no money and so some company isn't interested, then you're just out of luck until you can get somebody to do that. There is an absolute good, I think, in making books and other materials available in minority languages or in lesser used languages, because you have to remember that some of these languages are spoken by tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of people, even though they're economically disadvantaged and don't get technical support. So many of you are students of language and language technology, and I don't know, I just urge you to think from time to time about how lucky the majority languages are and how rare and precious linguistic diversity is, and if you can find time in your careers or in your hobby time to support linguistic diversity, that would be okay. <laughs>